Today's message is the greatest of these. Everybody say the greatest of these. The greatest of these. You might already know where that comes from, but we're going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, Paul said that the greatest of these among faith, hope, and love is love. And so we're going to be talking about that today. Those of you joining us online, thank you so much. We're so glad that you're here. If you're on YouTube, you can hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share this video with your friends so they can hear the word of God as well. We so appreciate our eFam, our online community. In addition to those of you here in person, thank you for being here today. We're going to recap a little bit of last week's message, which was on how Abraham was credited righteousness by faith. And we're going to be turning first to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So if you want to join me there... I have it open here. This is the NIV. We're reading together. And we're just reading one verse from this story. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram believed the Lord. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is good news. That a person can believe the word that God says to them and God will credit righteousness to them. And we talked about this last last week, but that's how man fell into sin. Man stopped believing God and believed Satan instead. And then their works simply proved their unbelief. They ate the fruit. People always think that eating the fruit was the first sin. It's not the first sin. The first sin was committed when man stopped believing in his heart what God said was true. And this is why salvation comes by faith, not by works, is because if you really believe, then yes, you'll do good works, just like if you have unbelief, you'll do evil works. So the works just stand as evidence of what's going on internally. And that's why salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God. It is a gift. And that's what credited means. Is credit earned? No. We talked about that some last week. Uh, Maybe the most common in today's society would be a tax credit. You have a baby and you get a tax credit. Did you necessarily earn that money by work? No, it's just credited to you. Okay. Now, again, not going deep into government and all of that, just making a point. Credits exist. They happen. Of course, people think of credit cards. That you have to pay back. With God's credit, or even with a tax credit, you do not have to pay it back. That's why I use the tax credit instead of credit cards. Credit cards are not really credit, they're loans. They're just a a loan with a high interest rate. God is not giving us a loan. God is giving us a credit. doesn't say he loaned him righteousness. It says he credited him righteousness because he believed what he said. And so everything hangs on whether you believe God or disbelieve God. And if you believe God, you'll obey him. And if you disbelieve God, you'll do just like even Adam did. You'll disobey him. And this is why the scriptures make such a case, even in the New Testament, in the midst of this dispensation of grace, this age of grace, when the Holy Spirit came on the church, when 3,000 were saved, instead of 3,000 died, right? When the law came, 3,000 died in Israel. When grace by the Spirit came at Pentecost, 3,000 lived and were given salvation, right? So we are in a different age than then. Good news, too. But even in this age, this fact remains. If you believe, you will obey. And if you disbelieve, you will disobey. And that's just what it comes down to. Now, the good news is we have grace and forgiveness when we repent. We do. We have grace and forgiveness. In the Old Testament, listen, when an animal was sacrificed or what have you, a lot of times a lot of judgment would still come. It would just reduce the punishment. Now it's total forgiveness because of Jesus' blood. Total release from the curse and the judgment that a person deserves. And so when it says that Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, what that means is you haven't earned it. Say, I haven't earned it. You haven't. Very important part of the gospel. You are not entitled to the salvation given you. You have not earned it. You are not entitled to it. It is not yours except by grace. 
through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the word made flesh. So Abram believing God is representative of us believing Jesus Christ, who is the word of God put in a body given unto you, the son of the living God. Who is himself God, the scriptures say. Why? Because the word and God, the father, are one. People get confused by that quick explanation. You're made in the image of God. You are a mind. You are a body. You are a spirit. You are three in one. It's not that wild. So God is a father, son, spirit. The father, son, spirit. Three in one. It's, it's not that bizarre. I get that God is transcendental. Of course he is. He exists beyond our existence. He is much more wonderful than we are, but you're still made in his image. So you can understand him. Amen. So Abram is credited righteousness. You are credited righteousness by believing what God has said. Not entitled. You have not earned it. It is not a wage paid to you. In fact, the scriptures say that the wages of sin is death. The wage due you is destruction, is what the Bible says. And Jesus affirms that reality. He went to the cross because that's your reality. He went to the cross because your wage that is due you is death and destruction. Yes. Now we're at church. First thing, Amen. your wage due you if you're talking about entitlement, your entitlement in the kingdom of God is death. True. Death. That punishment is so real and present that Jesus took it upon himself. Because the father, while he will fulfill his law that he has put forth, part of his law includes this opportunity for forgiveness. Amen. And I'm glad he wrote that in there too and decided that was part. See, a sacrifice can be made in place of the person themselves being sacrificed. Amen. See, Abram believed God so much that he offered his son Isaac on the altar, didn't he? Yes. And when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, honestly, God wasn't out of line requiring that of him, saying, offer your son to me. Why? Abraham was a sinner just like anybody else. Wages of sin is death. That includes your offspring. That includes you. That includes everybody. Wages of sin is death. And Abraham offers his son, doesn't he? By faith. <clears throat> By faith. He believes God. Amen. Offers his son. What does God do? Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy, on the lad. Why? Why? Because I have a ram for you, a male lamb to sacrifice in his place. Your son deserves to die. You deserve to die. All of humanity in the flood received what they deserved. <clears throat> you could be as mad at God as you want about that. They still drowned. Didn't matter how mad they were. It doesn't really matter. When you're dealing with a being that created you and has immense power over you, it doesn't really matter what you think. Mm -hmm. I just, man, we're arrogant. It's true. We really are. It don't matter what you think. It don't matter what you say. All that matters is what he thinks, what he says. Yeah. Thankfully, this living God who gave the law made a way so that Isaac didn't have to be sacrificed, so that Abraham didn't have to be sacrificed, so that man didn't have to keep dying and being destroyed for his sins. God sent his son into the world that everyone who would believe in him would be saved. Jesus came, the scriptures say, as the lamb of God, Slain before the foundations of the world. In other words, God from the beginning loved his creation. He's God. He knew the sins. He knew them before they'd be committed. 
You and I, as we walk them out, yeah, it's a real, it's an active relationship. You'll notice with God, you know, he's not going, well, I know what you're going to do in 10 years, so I'm not going to be nice to you. You get what I'm saying? It's active and he affords mercy to us at all times. And in fact, he wants to give us mercy so much that Jesus was slain before the foundations of the earth. That decision was already made. It was a done deal before we actually saw it, which is how faith works. Faith is done. You are confidently believing that it's done before you've seen it. And so the Father, the Son, and the Spirit decided, yep, Jesus is going to go in flesh and he's going to be murdered by them. And his murder is going to, his blood spilling is going to pay for their blood so that their blood doesn't have to be spilled for their sins. And remember, we're talking about eternal things. So this body still dies. We enter into the glorified body. Or if you're a sinner, this body dies. You're resurrected another time in this same body to face judgment. The Bible actually doesn't really refer to the death of this body as death. It most of the time says sleep. Almost all of the Old Testament says sleep. Jesus calls it sleep. This is just sleep. This body goes to sleep. You wake up in the new body. Or you wake up at judgment in the same body. But this body goes to sleep because God will not strive with sinful man forever. So we go to sleep. He also doesn't make us endure the hardships of this life forever. So we go to sleep, we wake up, and then the Bible, Revelation, calls this death that happens at judgment day, calls it the second death, the real death. And that's where the sheep and the goats are separated. That's where the the sheep enter life, the goats enter destruction. That's the real death, the Bible says. So this one's sleep, that one's real death. That one's real life and real death. Eternal life or destruction, eternal destruction. This is important to understand. Why am I talking about these things? Because we're talking about salvation here. If Abraham was, if was credited righteousness by faith, we better understand what that means. It means it's not earned. Okay? And I want you to understand something else. It can be taken away because it's not a wage. And for those of you who think, oh no, once saved, always saved, eternal security. You go and read the parable of the unmerciful servant. You go and read the parable of the unmerciful servant. And that's not the only one. There's plenty of others. There's Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, 2 Peter 2, all dealing with apostates. Thessalonians talks about the great apostasy in the last days. You can't be an apostate if you're not first a believer. Jesus' disciples turn around no longer follow him in John chapter 6, verse 66. Not the 12, but a group of them left him who had believed. Jesus says in the, in the parable of the sower in Luke, listen, this is important stuff. He says that, they, that one of the groups, they believe for a while and then in the time of testing fall away. Well, believe for a while indicates that how do you receive salvation? It's by belief. So if they're believing for a while, you and I don't determine what a while is. A while might be 20 years. A while might be 20 days. It might be 20 years. They believe for a while and in the time of testing, they fall away. Times of testing come. God tested Abraham. Give me your son, your only son. Right? God tested Job. Okay, you can strike his body. He'll still believe. Times of testing come. No material provision. Though God is our promised provider in all things, there could be a time of testing. Times of testing come, and people stop believing in those times of testing, and Jesus warned it. So something that's credited can be taken away. The parable of the unmerciful servant, he is credited total forgiveness. He didn't earn it. He just begged the king. Go read it, Matthew 18. He begs the king for forgiveness. The king gives it to him, and then a fellow servant sins against him, and he goes and chokes that servant and throws him in prison. The king hears about it. He says, you wicked servant, shouldn't you have forgiven your fellow servant as I forgave you all of your debts? Yes. Amen. This is true. And then he puts all of his debt back on him because it was credited, not earned. Credit can be taken. It's not an earned wage. Puts it back on him, 
all of his debt back on him. And it says he hands him over to the jailer to be tortured until he paid back all that he, could, that he owed, which was an insurmountable amount. He could not pay it back. That was the point of his begging the king for forgiveness of the debt because it was more than he could pay. And then Jesus makes it very clear at the end of that story. He says, this is how my heavenly father will treat you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from your heart. All right, so no, you will never change my mind regarding once saved, always saved in eternal security. I trust Jesus. It can be taken from you. If you defiantly live in unrepentant sin like unforgiveness. See, Jesus said that he holds us in his hand and no one can snatch us out. But understand the concept. Snatched out. That's the devil coming along and just ripping somebody out arbitrarily. It's not how it works. No. Paul says in Romans that you've been grafted in because of Jesus Christ. You know what else Paul says? Behold both the kindness and the sternness of the Lord. Kindness provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Jesus taught it. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain in me and I remain in you and you'll produce good fruit. But he says, if you don't remain in me, you'll be cut off and thrown into the fire. You, you can't remain in something that you're not even attached to. He's talking about believers. Yes. He's warning disciples, remain in me. Not unbelie- unbelievers, he's saying repent and believe. Believers, he's saying keep believing. Do you understand the difference? Yes. And then people trip up on this too. There are people who were never believers to begin with and they were pretending That's a group that's in the Bible. That's not the only group. There's false believers. Go look it up. There's false believers and there's apostates, two different groups. False believers never believed. They just pretended because they were trying to get something. Apostates believed. Satan is the first apostate. In the Old Testament, it says that he was perfect because everything God makes is perfect. He's perfect. Perfect in beauty, perfect in wisdom. Guardian cherub walked in Eden, walked on the mountain of God, walked in heaven. Guardian angel. In fellowship with the Father. Apostates. What does that mean? Leaves. Leaves, rebels, willfully. Did he get snatched out of the Father's hand? No, he left the Father's hand. He left. You also can be cut off. If something's credited to you, if you're grafted in, you can be cut off. Behold both the kindness and sternness. Kindness, so long or provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Why am I saying that? It's more important than you might know to understand that what's credited to you can be given up and forfeited. That's very important to understand. I know that the devil has taught eternal security in the church to a lot of people. We're not just talking about reformed people. We're talking about lots of people believe once saved, always saved at this point in the United States. It does a few things. It protects them from conviction because if God convicts them to go and help somebody and adopt or do something and they don't, they just go once saved, always saved, which that's not how Abraham ever responded. He didn't go, well, I'm not going to offer Isaac, but I'm once saved, always saved. So we're, we're not learning that from Abraham. Abraham obeyed, so you won't be able to be like, well, look at Abraham. He's righteous by faith, and he did nothing like me. That's not how it works. So it protects us from conviction to believe in once saved, always saved. And it puts us to sleep. It puts people to sleep. 
they become the priest and the Levite who can pass by in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And they can be like, I'm good. I'm a priest. I'm a Levite. No, you're not. It enables a person to believe, okay, well, the king forgave all my sins, so I can choke you and throw you in prison. <laughs> yeah, that's where that, how do you think a man forgiven of all of his debts would come to that conclusion that he's allowed to choke and throw that other man into prison? Where would you get that from? It has to be that he thought, this can't be taken away from me. It has to be. See, I see the fruits of eternal security. And while it sounds really academically pleasing, the fruits of it are this. Laziness, unrepentance, no good works, greed, disobedience, lawlessness, arrogance. Oh, It's hard to find a more arrogant group. They're competing with the atheists, the group that thinks, under all conditions, I'm entering life because I say the right words. I think it's easier, I really do, because I have, I have engaged in lots of debates, as some of you may know. And I think it's easier to reach an atheist than it is a Christian who thinks everything's fine. I have an easier time engaging an atheist who is, no doubt, arrogantly saying that God doesn't exist than a person who is arrogantly allowed to disobey God because they go, well, I'm once saved, always saved. There's nothing that can change that. You know, so if I disobey, it's whatever. It's a dangerous place to be. So why am I telling you this? Because I don't want you to get ensnared by these traps, very common traps. If it has to do with your salvation, you best believe that Satan is wanting to confuse and deceive. And he's got more than one method. Once saved, always saved. He's also got works-based salvation, which is not believing and therefore obeying. That's what Abraham did. Works-based salvation is, I am going to earn salvation by doing this. And you know when you start to obey Jesus after being saved that you still fail plenty of times that you need God's mercy. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Right? So it's not works-based salvation either. You rely on the mercy of God. You're not going to make it without this mercy and this grace that God <laughs> gives. We're none of us. We know the Bible says we know and rely on the love God has for us. I don't rely on my works. I rely on God loving me. Amen. But I also believe him when he warns me and he says, "Listen, buddy, if you walk in unforgiveness all the way to death, you are not entering life. Or if you walk in murder, why do you think that I talk about that so much? You know, praise God, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Wonderful. You know now 50 states have to make a decision on life. You know what the scriptures say? Murderers will not inherit life. That's what the scriptures say. Right? So what do we do? Well, we want to help people not do that anymore. Please, God will forgive you if you have. some of the, I was telling my mom recently, some of the biggest advocates in the pro-life movement are women who had terminated babies. Yes. And they're going to other women that are going, look, just let's not do this. It's not a good idea. And what, is it, what does that do? It helps create a culture of life. It helps people not commit murder. Why? Because just like this once saved, always saved, unforgiveness, perpetual, unto death. If you are murdering unto death, you are not going to enter life. That's what the Bible says. If you're living in sexual sin unto death, you are not going to enter life. If you're living in greed unto death, you are not going to enter life. What does this mean? What it means is that you can be free from sin. And here's where a lot of people get angry too. Jesus taught it in John 8. That if you remain in his word, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And he's talking about sin. Read the passage. You can be free. Acts says it. Acts says it, that you can be forgiven through Jesus Christ and freed from every sin. All of Romans 6 is on being free from sin. John's first epistle, in fact, all three of them to some degree, but his first epistle is big on being free from sin and not sinning anymore. Why? Because habitual sin, unrepentant unto death, results in destruction. 
So you've been forgiven to now live a new life. That's what the Bible constantly talks about. Forgiven to live a new life, a new life, a new life, new creature, new life. Yep. Yes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, so that no man can boast. It is the gift of God. Amen. Right? That's what we learn. Yes. But then 10 says, for you're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Why? Because you're a new creature after that grace and faith experience. Abraham was credited righteousness and then he lived righteously. You can't, Abraham testifies against you people who are teaching others that you could live in sin after believing and still be saved. Abraham testifies against you for he was credited righteousness by faith, not by works because he has sinned just like anyone else. And then he enters life. Why? Because God credited him righteousness. But what does he do after he's credited? Obeys. He lives a life of righteousness, doesn't he? Amen. Amen. We point out Moses' failures. I made that point last week. If Moses wasn't going to make it on his works, neither will you. But Moses believed so much that when God said, go back to Egypt, he went. When God said, put your staff in the water and it'll turn into blood. He did it. Amen. When he said, put your staff in the water and it'll part. He did it. Amen. Yes. When God said, strike the rock, he did do it. And it did. Water did come out. When he said, make a serpent on a pole represents Jesus, the despised one on a pole. If everybody will just stare at it, they'll be healed. He did it. Jesus, See, Moses's faith led to obedience. Did he fail? Yeah, that's what grace is for. But he certainly didn't live in rebellion. See, a lot of people have gone the way of Balaam. And they don't even know the story of Balaam. And he's brought up a lot in the New Testament. It's an Old Testament story. But Balaam was a prophet of God. Not a false prophet. False prophets are people who prophesy things that don't come true. Read Deuteronomy. He's a prophet. The Bible even calls him a prophet. The prophet Balaam. Yes. Not the false prophet Balaam. The prophet Balaam. Yeah. Yeah. Second Peter 2 talks about him. Do you know what Balaam does? Well, he sure, he prophesies for God. He reminds me of the Matthew 7 group. Didn't we prophesy in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Balaam did mighty works. Balaam would make seven altars. He'd sacrifice animals on them and God would speak to him. The living God, not Satan. The living God spoke to Balaam. Balaam blessed Israel multiple times. Spoke blessings over them. You know what else Balaam did? Balaam wanted to receive money. This was Balaam's problem. He wanted to receive money. In fact, he wanted money more than to please God. So he accepted the wages of a king who said, show me because you can't, he couldn't curse Israel. He just couldn't. Spirit wouldn't, once he was in the spirit, he would only speak blessings over Israel. Oh yeah, this is a man who operated in the gifts of God too, by the way. But he wanted money. And so he devised a plan. And it really is regarded as one of the most wicked plans. He devised a plan how to entice the Israelites to commit sexual sin, like go to orgies or to uh, temple prostitutes, how to entice them with this king that wanted Israel to be cursed. Because Balaam knew the law of God. And he knew that if they would all commit sexual sin, it would bring harsh punishment quickly. And that's true all throughout the scriptures. That group of 3,000 that dies when the Ten Commandments are given, that was the 3,000 that engaged in the sexual immorality. Not just the idol worship. They, the, there was a group of idol worship, but then some of them broke off into essentially an orgy. Those 3,000 died. So sexual sin brings this consequence faster throughout scripture. Look, look, I mean, just... Read through. So Balaam knows this. And they successfully entice the Israelites to commit sexual sin. And judgment comes upon the Israelites because of how the law works. And many of the Israelites are destroyed because Balaam brought about their destruction. See, talk about some serious doctrine. Balaam's a real prophet and he's on his way to hell. 
Do you understand that? And that's the warning that the Bible gives more than once. Balaam's a real prophet on his way to hell. Jesus talks about that kind of person in Matthew 7. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do mighty works in your name? And I'll say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. That's the Balaam's. How could Balaam get there? I'll tell you how. I've been in religion long enough to see how this works. He believed that because he was a genuine bona fide prophet, that somehow he would escape judgment for doing evil. So he could both do the worldly thing and the godly thing and somehow get away with that. And Jesus says in Revelation, doesn't he? You're neither hot nor cold, but are lukewarm. And you better repent because I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. Balaam was lukewarm. He wanted to do both the sinful thing and the righteous thing. And he's destroyed for it. Folks, we are credited righteousness by faith, which means it's not earned, which is the very reason why it can be taken away from you, just like it was taken away from the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18 just like it was taken away from Balaam. A gen- you know, to become an actual prophet, he must have had at least a season of living righteously with the Lord. So if it could happen to Balaam, if it could happen to Judas, yes. if it could happen to Satan, yep. Yep. among others, oh, it can happen to us. And so we know and rely the love, on the love that God has for us, but we also recognize that if we really believe, well, Abraham proves to us that belief results in obeying God. Let's read Romans 4. Romans 4 with me. I'm going to switch to the literal word app. Let's go to Romans 4, start from verse 9. says this, and we read this last week, but we'll read it again, because as you can tell, we're going in a bit different direction. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Amen. And it was. Praise God, it's a credit. You don't have to earn it. That's the good news. Verse 10. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? In other words, while he was obedient or disobedient? He had not yet walked in obedience, not to this level. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Praise God. That's why you can go into the prisons and into the prostitution brothels. I'm serious. You can go into the drug addicts corridors. You can go into the bars. You can go anywhere. And everyone there could get saved that day. Amen. Right then. Yep. Amen. Because Abraham was credited righteousness while he was uncircumcised. So that means that the prostitute can be credited righteousness Amen. right there. And that's what happened with the woman caught in adultery, isn't it? Yep. Yes. Was she told to go and leave her life of sin first? No. What happened first? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Isn't that what happened first? Aren't you glad that's what happens first? That's what, what if Jesus said, go now and leave your life of sin and then I'll forgive you? No one's going to make it. No one's going to make it. What does he say first? I will credit righteousness to you. I forgive you. If that has really happened for you, why are you so mad when Jesus then says, go now and leave your life of sin? Why are you so mad at the preachers who tell you, go now and leave your life of sin? Why do you scream back at us, I can't? Yes, you can. Jesus is with you. You can do all things with Jesus. 
Hallelujah. That yes. woman doesn't have to walk back to that bed. Nope. No. Does she? No. No. She's been forgiven. She can leave her life of sin. She's been redeemed. She's set free. It's either true or it's not. Thank you. Some of y'all are preaching that when Jesus said, go now and leave your life of sin, she couldn't help but go back to that bed. That's a lie. Yes. She didn't go back to that bed. Yep. No. She left her life of sin. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're not tempted. But where you couldn't say no before, you can say no now. Amen. That's what yeah. Titus 2 says. Yeah. Titus 2 says the grace of God has appeared that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Man, the liar is in the church, you guys, and he's lying through the teeth of believers. And you got to stop listening to him and listen to the word. I know people aren't listening to the word. Here's why. I've been doing an exercise lately on social media. Anybody who shows up with a religious spirit just wants to debate, okay? I only, it is written them. I barely say anything. Just passages. Just passages. And then they, they don't respond with any passages. And they almost always say, I know the scriptures. Yeah, right. I know the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. They won't even let God's word in. And if I'm not likable, God did it on purpose so that you'd look past me yes. and appreciate his word regardless of the vessel. See, if God uses Paul, who formerly murdered you, yeah. it's because he wants you to look past Paul yeah. yes. and to look at the word. See, if I'm challenging for you, if I'm irritating, no, I'm serious. The word is still true. The vessel doesn't matter. Right. Mm, you're not going to be able to tell God, well, Rich told me, and you know Rich. See, that's how they treated Jesus. They said, oh, that Nazarene. Yeah. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anyone have the last name Tidwell and be good in the kingdom? In fact, Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you also. That's right. Oof. That's not good news because a lot of people are hating me. Here's something else I find strange because God's word is true. I'll go and I'll minister in other places, other cities, other areas, new people. And a lot of times the majority just receives it. That's weird. And then in my town, Jesus said something about that once. He said, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Interesting. Despised him without honor. Maybe Rich actually is speaking for God. Maybe you should look past the vessel and see who's speaking unto you, child and recognize that I've used a despised vessel on purpose because that's what he uses. Why was there a serpent on the pole with Moses? A despised vessel. Snakes are despised by the Jews. Why? Because they represent Satan. Despised. Jesus would be despised. Did they not say to Jesus that he had a devil and that he was using the power of Satan to drive out devils? And that he himself was a devil? Hmm. Despised. Pay attention to the word and stop paying attention to the vessel. Look past the vessel. Listen to the word. Because the word is true. Yes, it is. The word is true. And that's how I know there's something wrong. Because I will respond with just the Bible. I'm serious. This has been an exercise I've been doing lately. I will, don't get me wrong, I mean, I will respond with some explanations and things. But there are times where I'm responding with just the Bible. 
And all that's responded is anger, frustration, claims of being a false prophet, claims of wrong, claims of, and I go, buddy, I didn't even say anything. None of that was even me. I just wrote you the Bible. See, the problem is man's heart not believing what God has said. It has nothing to do with the vessels. You know, most of the prophets were killed. Jesus is killed. Most of the apostles are killed. (laughs) You better pay attention to the despised people. You also better be careful because Jesus said, watch out when all manner of men speak well of you. Did you know that? If everyone's speaking well of you, watch out. Mm-hmm. Something's wrong. If everybody else got killed and you're really, really, I'm not saying like you have pockets of people who like you. I'm, I'm saying that like when you just speak to the general public as a minister, everybody kind of just can get along with what you're saying. Watch out. Yeah. You're not saying what they need to hear. There is too much sin for everybody to like you. If you're really preaching, repent and obey God. So, good news. (laughs) The sinners are afforded righteousness just by grace through faith. (laughs) The prostitute can be saved, but she will leave her life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. It's not an empty command. This is how I feel like a lot of believers are treating God's word. It's empty to them. Jesus says, go now and leave your life of sin. And it's empty to them. They go, that means nothing to me. I don't have to. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. I don't have to. I'm righteous by faith. Forgive your neighbor who has sinned against you. I don't have to. I'm righteous by faith. I can guarantee you, just based on how bratty that is, that you're not going to enter the kingdom. That's not somebody who greatly appreciates mercy. That's somebody who arrogantly misuses it, like Balaam, like the unmerciful servant. That person is not going to enter life. Verse 11, and he received the sign. See, pay attention. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Abraham proves to us that righteousness is credited because you believe the word of God. And all I'm revealing when I say that all I'm sharing with people are Bible verses who are angry about things, whatever sin it is, is that they're not believing the word of God. And that's why they're not circumcising. Now, in the new covenant, of course, you want to be circumcised of heart. And I'm going to talk about what the sign and seal is for this new covenant in just a moment. But the point is, they're not obeying because they're not believing and just teaching them the Bible proves that they're not believing. Now, faith comes by hearing. So punching bag rich just keeps putting it out there. Oh, and it's not just Facebook. You go on Facebook, you're like, man, people are mean. Listen, TikTok blew up. (laughs) We're at almost 10,000 subscribers. (laughs) I get even more of it on TikTok. There's a lot of people not believing what God's word says. A lot that are claiming and, they need it. and they're not. And they need it. We all need it. We can't live without it. We need it. Amen. Yeah, breath of life, bread of life, living waters, the scriptures say. You need air, you need food, you need water. And God says, my word is all three of those. You can't live without those things. And notice what it says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. Where is your seal, new covenant church saved by the faith of Abraham? Where is your seal? What is your seal? Can you even answer that question? You're right if you answer it's not circumcision of the flesh. Good. What is the seal of the new covenant Christian church 
saved by grace through faith, just like Abraham was. Did Abraham do a work after he was saved? Yes. What is your seal? See, you knew of Abraham's righteousness because of his circumcision. All of Israel knew it. That was his seal. It was a sign to you and me, and it was the seal that showed that he had righteousness by faith. What's your sign and seal? There is one. If you're children of Abraham, you definitely have a sign and a seal. Amen. You definitely do. And because the Holy Spirit is invisible, because I know some people would answer Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is invisible, I would present to you that this is a visible seal, just like circumcision was. You want to know what it is? If you do, say amen. amen. Okay, good. John chapter 13. Let's go to John 13. I'll show you the seal. Jesus said what the seal is. Jesus said what the outward evidence that you're his disciple would be. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know how I know that a person isn't a disciple of Jesus? They don't love me. And I'm a disciple. They don't love you. And you're a disciple. That's a pretty big indicator they're not a disciple. They could become one, but they're not one. They're a Pharisee. They're not a disciple yet. They know the word some. They're not believing it. Because if you've really been forgiven by God, if you've really come in contact with how much sin you have, then when you meet the homeless person, you don't despise them. When you meet the prostitute, you don't despise them. You don't avoid them. When you meet the drug addict, you don't despise them. When you meet the orphan, you don't despise them. Despise can also, it doesn't have to be like you hate, a, like, like it doesn't have to be like you're mean to them. It's just that you're indifferent. So you encounter the homeless, you're indifferent. You encounter the orphan, you're indifferent. You encounter the widow, you're indifferent. You encounter, you avoid them. That's indifference. Ah, my tax dollars. Cover that. I pay my taxes. You're indifferent to people. You don't have the love of God in you. You're not a disciple. You can scream about being a disciple to me. You're not one. Because Jesus said, by this, everyone will know. That means I can know whether you're a disciple or not. I can know. I can know by love. And it won't be by knowledge either. There are people who do not have very much biblical knowledge. I mean, if, you, if a prostitute just got saved, is she going to have a lot of biblical knowledge? No. But... Like the woman at the well, she's probably going to be like telling everybody about Jesus. That's a pretty good indicator. I was elect before the foundations of the world, and I don't tell anyone. I just tell them that they're sinners, right? There's this attitude that people develop if they're really saved and if they're not. And if they're really saved, they know that they're the prostitute who's been forgiven, yeah. and so they're just merciful and loving to other people. That's right. yes. Just this what it is. The one who's been forgiven much, loveth much. Mm -hmm. yes. The one who's been forgiven little, loveth little. Right. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Love people. Yes. See, Abraham's seal, the sign to all of us, was his circumcision of the flesh. And now we're circumcised of the heart, which you can't actually see that. So how does it manifest? How do you know someone's been circumcised of the heart? So yeah, the sign and the seal is still circumcision. But what I'm saying is, you can't see circumcision of the heart like you can circumcision of the flesh. 
Literally, the men of Israel would actually prove to each other that they were circumcised. The adult males would circumcise themselves at when they would believe or when they would repent. And then, of course, everyone knew if it was a baby that had been circumcised, the parents could testify, you know. So everyone actually physically knew that people were circumcised or not. So how do people know whether you're a disciple of Jesus? By faith. Well, circumcision of the heart's not visible. The Holy Spirit's work inside, we can't see with the eyes. So how does it manifest itself outwardly? How do we see that seal in this physical realm that we're in? We see it by love. And that's why he says in verse 35, by this all men, say all men, men. will know, say will know, know. all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. All men will know. Now, yeah, love speaks the truth. Love disciplines. I know. I know it's not all just butterflies. I get it. I understand. Jesus cracked the whip in the temple because he loved everybody. If they'd listen to him and repent, they'd be saved. Okay, I get it. There's going to be some firm discussions even in love. I understand that. I'm not... But are you caring about the orphan, the widow, the stranger, the sick, the imprisoned? Are you doing anything? You're pro-life. Great. Are you giving to pregnancy crisis centers? Are you willing to adopt a baby that's not getting aborted? Because it's more than just saying I'm pro-life. It is more than legislation. I'm all for legislation. I am for legislation to stop murder. Okay? But that is not the end of it. That's the beginning. It has to continue in love. Are you willing to adopt? Great. I'm, glad. I'm telling you, we'd be like, Jesus, I'm pro-life. We'd be like, great, adopt that little baby that's not going to get aborted. Are you saying yes or are you saying, once saved, always saved, I don't have to. Oh, Jesus, it'd be really hard to add them to my family right now. That's a real common response to God. That's not a joke. Too busy. Too many kids already. No, I wouldn't make a good parent. That don't work either. Moses said, I wouldn't make a good prophet. God's like, you're still the prophet that I'm sending. That doesn't matter. So if he says, if he says, you're the adoptive parents for that child. See, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I know God. He has told at least somebody for every one of those kids that's in care that can be adopted. At least somebody has been told, that's your child. And they said, no. That's the only way those kids still are in care. That is the only way. That is the only way. So if your version of believing in Jesus does not result in you loving your neighbors to the point that all men know that you love your neighbors, that you care, that you care more than just words. Yes. See, even telling somebody the Bible, that is nice. I preach the Bible all the time. But you've got to actually apply it. You've got to actually help people. You've got to actually care. Right. Sure, I will debate with people about truth. Yeah, but that's not all I do. That shouldn't be all you do either. No. For some people, that's, that is the length of their faith practice, is to argue with people about the Bible. And it's biblical. I mean, Apollos, it says, vigorously refuted his opponents in the temple courts. Sure, that's part of the Bible. Jesus got in debates with people. Sure, it's part of the Bible. Did Jesus only debate people? No. No. He had a fund for the poor. He was visiting and healing the sick. He was feeding the hungry. Hello. He wasn't just sitting around debating. He was doing something. I mean, even Jesus testifies against us. Jesus was busy loving his neighbors. And the Bible says that you're, if Christ is in you, you should be like him. Yes. You should be loving like he does. Debates are not how you prove How pious you are. How great is your faith. 
for you valiantly defend the scriptures on the internets. No, it's good to minister the Bible, but some of you, that's all you're doing. You're only fighting people about the word. You're not practicing it. You're not going out and doing it. You're just fighting people. I don't know who this is for, but you'll know. The Holy Spirit will tell you. You're just debating. Why don't you try giving to a charity and just soften up that heart a bit? Why don't you try signing up to foster and adopt and soften that heart up a bit, you know? Your heart's hard because all you're doing is fighting what the Bible says with people who don't want to believe it. Well, you're not believing it either, according to the Scriptures, if you're not loving thy neighbor. I don't really care if you understand eschatology if you're not loving your neighbor, and neither will God. He won't care that you figured out what Revelation said if you didn't love your neighbor. God didn't care that Balaam knew how to make proper sacrifices, blessed Israel, right? We did many mighty works in your name. God didn't care about that. Balaam didn't love his neighbors. Balaam loved money more than people, just like Judas. And he was willing to trick them into sexual immorality so they'd get destroyed so he could cash out. That's sick. Some of you are using the gospel to cash out. You don't really love people. You love their money. That's why you'll only preach where there's a thousand people or more. You know, you never come and speak at my church. You'd be like, oh, eight people. I'm not going there. There's no money. You know, God didn't charge you when he gave you the wisdom to write that book. That's right. Why are you charging people? Yeah. Shouldn't the book be free if it was free for you? Why are you charging tickets? Why are we selling Bibles? You know, historically, Bible salesmen were kind of like a despised group of people. I see why. It shouldn't be sold. It should be the generosity of human beings that we print these and give them. Little word app is free. He built a concordance into it. He wouldn't even let us send him a donation. I was like, hey, we'd like to give a love offering for all this work that you've done. He's like, I'm not accepting donations. I was like, okay, Paul. <laughs> the Lord will bless him. See, do you love people? Are you just arguing? Are you just debating? I get it. Arguments and debates happen. Are you just doing that? Are there, is there any sign? of love? Is there any seal of love? Because people are made in God's image and yeah, they're, yeah, we're all really broken. Yeah. We've all got bad doctrines. We've all got things that we're getting wrong. Are you, are you caring about their needs of the body? When they're sick, are you visiting them? When they're in prison, are you visiting them? When they're a stranger or an orphan, are you inviting them into your home? Are you doing just something, folks? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, if you do. And you can't just say that you do. You have to actually have it. Let's read Luke 10. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. All right, verse 25. Luke 10, 25. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Some of y'all out there would say, Just believe. And you know what? Jesus did say that. The work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. Okay, here's where we're going to define belief. Because belief always has a sign and a seal. If it did for Abraham, it does for you. If he was circumcised, you're circumcised. His was in the flesh, yours is of heart. And it presents itself as love. Your circumcision of the heart means that your heart has been circumcised. What does that mean? It means that the part of it that needed to get cut out, the part that wasn't good, is cut out and you love. Amen. That's the circumcision yeah. of the heart, folks. Amen. Yeah. Verse 26, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Let me point out this conversation that's taking place here. This is an expert in the law. What does that mean? It means they can recite scripture. Okay. So there are a lot of Christians who I would consider probably experts in what is written. They, they, they could cite scripture, no problem, just like I can. So that is not, that's not the factor here, is it? I can cite lots of scripture to people. If you've been in the word faithfully for 20 plus years, you're going to have a decent amount of it memorized and you'll be able to cite it or reference it or paraphrase it. Do you understand? Yes. Expert of law can do the same thing. In fact, he can do this so well, he answers Jesus' question correctly. And some of you, I think, you think that that is how you're going to enter life, is that you're going to correctly answer questions. <laughs> if only. That's not it. What did Jesus say in verse 28 after he answered it correctly? And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Some of y'all, I really think, that's it. It's done. You answered correctly. That's not it. It's not done. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Do this. Why would Jesus? Jesus, we're credited righteousness by faith. Why would you say that? He answered correctly and we're righteous by faith. You told him, do this? Yes, because if you are circumcised of heart, then you will do this. Amen. See, Abraham believed and was righteous by faith and then he did what God said. If you're going to look to Abraham as an example of faith, you better pay attention. The story didn't stop at Genesis 15, 6. It went on to a lot of doing. Abraham did a lot of doing yes. after being righteous by faith. Do this and you will live, verse 29. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who? is my neighbor. Mm -hmm. Note this about the expert of the law. He just wants this thing to just be intellectual. He is hoping and pleading that right answers and right doctrines is what's needed. In fact, he's a little shocked that Jesus just said, do this, because an expert in the law would have known that Abraham was credited righteousness by faith. That's why he's an expert. And so he's a bit thrown off that his correct answer was responded with a do this. So he says, oh, oh, I don't like do this. Here's how you know you're dealing with a Pharisee. I don't like do this. I like correct answers. I don't like do this is. I know that's not proper English. <laughs> right? I don't know who this is for. Somebody's going to hear this that yeah. needed to hear it. Amen. God doesn't just want a correct answer. The correct answer is to be followed up with a do this. Yeah. Verse 29, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I'll tell you, this guy, he would have gone back and forth with Jesus just in an intellectual conversation. So Jesus just went right to the heart of the matter. I know you're smart. I know you give the right answers. So I'm going to test you, not your doctrines. I'm going to test you. Do you realize that? I can have all the right doctrines in the world. God's not going to test my doctrines necessarily. If it's true, it came from him anyways. Why would he test his own word? Of course, his word is true. He's going to test me just like he tested Abraham. If Abraham is righteous by faith and he was tested by God, do you think you won't be? Verse 30, 
<clears throat> Luke 10, 30. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. I always point this out. We don't know if this man was beat up just because people were being mean or if this man actually had stolen from them and this was an eye for an eye situation, which would have been lawful. Hmm. If he stole your cattle, you take his. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Right? That's the fairness of the law. So maybe the fairness of the law came upon this man. He got what he deserved. I hear people talk like this. I know I'm making caricatures. This is how people talk. He got what we all deserve, honestly. I mean, when I look at that, yeah, beat up, left in a dish. Yeah, my sins deserve that. Verse 31. And by chance, <laughs> is anything by chance? And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A, a pre God sent a priest. He sent one of these experts in the law types who answer correctly when asked questions. I went to seminary. I can answer that question. Good. Do it. He sent one of those types. He did it on purpose because he's talking to that type. And so in this story, he sends that type first. And he says, yeah, I sent someone like you. And he passed by. He could answer me correctly, but he passed by. Verse 32, likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And if you think about passing by on the other side, this is similar to us. Ooh, just stay away from that orphanage. Oh, Oh, just stay away from that jail. Oh. oh, I don't like to be around sick people in a hospital. Don't you know COVID exists? Oh, my goodness. Wow. Oh, I don't want to visit widows. Oh, they're, oh, they're old. I don't like the elderly. I've heard people say stuff like that. I don't like old people. We live in a society that won't even take care of their parents. I mean, it's the same society that is murdering the unborn, so it makes sense that we're not doing too well with our elders either. Pass by on the other side, avoided. God knows you avoid. You don't get out of it because you're like, well, I, I just didn't pay attention. He'll go, you did that on purpose. You'd have to be blind to not notice the evils that are in the world. You'd have to be deaf, dumb, and mute to not know. That person gets a pass because they literally don't know. They have no idea. You, you know. You know. Pass by two, two religious people. Man, this story's rough if you really, really, that's why we're dwelling on it for a minute. We're not just like reading through, oh, isn't this so nice? Two people passed by and they're both religious. One's the head of the church, one's a deacon, essentially. Priest, Levite. Top dog, deacon. Pastor, board members. Passed by. Could they answer correctly? Yeah. I mean, you could probably go to... All you could probably walk in any church and ask the pastor, what's the most important commandment in the law? And they go, so love God and to love your neighbor. I, 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 I don't think I've ever met a pastor who couldn't answer that correctly. Any, any expert in the law is going to answer that question correctly. That's why Jesus tests us. And then he gives this example and he uses us, the religious, and he says, look, religious, 
you pass by. You answer correctly, but you pass by. But a Samaritan, everybody say, a Samaritan. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. Here's the difference. Here's the juxtaposition, the contrast between the religious and the Samaritan. If you study Samaritans, Samaritans did not worship God correctly. They were considered sinful among the Israelites. They counted themselves as Israelites, but they were like confused pagan Israelites, if that makes sense. They're pretty worldly. The woman at the well, she had five husbands. She was a Samaritan. Does that tell you anything about the Samaritans? No woman in Israel had five husbands and remained part of the community. Okay, so clearly the Samaritans are doing some wrong things. And it's not like Jesus tolerated that. He was like, hey, uh, yeah, uh, you don't want to keep being an adulteress. You don't want to keep having five husbands. You know, he always told people to leave their life of sin. Don't get me wrong. But he's merciful. And even in this story, he uses a Samaritan as his prime example, which is really an insult to the priest and the Levite and specifically the expert in the law because he's one of those. In fact, some suppose that he did pass by the guy in the ditch and that Jesus was prophetically reciting the story of himself to him. But that is just a guess. And the Samaritan, who you could say is a sinner, it says, came upon him and when he saw him, he felt compassion. Is that what the other two who got the right answers did? No, no. Samaritan might even get the answer wrong based on what we know about Samaritans. He might even answer wrong. If you asked him the academic question, he might get it wrong. He really might. He certainly would get wrong where you're supposed to worship God. They went and would do it on a mountain where it's supposed to be in the temple. And it was wrong. He, Samaritans were part of the, you ever read in the Old Testament, it says, and on the high places they made sacrifices and worship the living God. Well, that was wrong, even though it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because God said to do it in the temple. This is a guy who does that kind of stuff. He worships wrong. They tolerate women with five husbands in their communities. This guy is not academically in good standing. Doctrinally needs some work. And I, listen, God wants us to have proper beliefs. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But when he saw the man, something was different about him compared to those others. He believed in the living God. Samaritans did. And he was moved with compassion for those made in God's image. That's what separated him. See, they'll know us by our love. Jesus said, they'll know you are my disciples because you love. This man had love. He didn't have right answers, not on everything. The expert in the law probably did. He probably could answer. He might be able to answer every question right. I'll tell you why that's possible. Is because Jews start learning the Torah when they're just little children. And if you're going to be a Levite, you learn it even more. And when you start serving the temple at 20, you have a thorough memorization of what's written. They were like, because people didn't necessarily own scrolls. They were like walking Bibles for people. God designed it that way. That's not a joke. So they'd be a walking Bible. And that's not a bad thing. They could give the answer. Even Jesus said this about the Pharisees. He said, listen to everything they teach you. But don't do what they do. To the Samaritan, he would say, listen to the experts in the law. They're right. But keep being a lover like you are. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Is this making sense? Yeah, absolutely. God loves truth. I'm not downing truth. Correct doctrine's great, but correct doctrine does nothing for you personally. It can help other people to teach the right doctrine. It does nothing for you personally 
if you don't do it. He felt compassion. See, he is a disciple of Jesus Christ because he feels compassion for people. He doesn't just know the right answer. He feels compassion. Isn't that Jesus? Jesus knows the right answer. Yes, daughter, your adultery is worthy of death. But I forgive you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die instead. I agree. You deserve death for that sin, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. And, and would you please leave that life? Because as you'll see at the crucifixion, it's a big cost what you're doing. What you're doing costs greatly. Will you leave that life? Truth and grace. You know, that's what John's gospel says. It says he was full of grace and truth. Right doctrine and compassion. See, folks, if you really want to get this right, boy, be full of grace and truth. Not just truth, not just grace. We don't just tolerate sin. Grace and truth. You're gracious to sinners. He felt compassion. When's the last time you felt compassion? I can tell you the first time I felt deep compassion. I had felt it at times, but I felt deep weeping compassion was the first time that I encountered a charity that was serving only children with cancer. And all the money goes to just providing their medical care for free. That was the first time I felt it real deeply. And it was the first time I really had, like, money. You know, I had been working and I had money. And I felt it. And it led to action. When are you feeling it anymore? Notice it says he felt compassion. You know, God made feelings. You know, when Jesus came on one of my videos where I was weeping about Noah and everybody being destroyed and how that's going to happen again, somebody gets on. I mean, I've had a lot of comments, but somebody gets on and says, why are you weeping for the wicked? Oh, that's more common than you think. Don't be surprised. I interact with enough people to know how humanity actually is. And all I did was say, well, it is written in Luke, when Jesus came upon Jerusalem, he wept over it. See, God created feelings. There's nothing wrong with feelings. Some of you are so hard. You can't feel anything anymore. Children with cancer, ah, it's just a debate topic. We'll just debate about divine healing. I don't teach divine healing because I want to debate it with you. I teach it because I want you to be healed. Amen. Let your heart break for people. That was something else that was different from the priest and the Levite. The Samaritan's heart broke for the man. When's the last time you felt anything? Especially men. Maybe ladies, maybe you can get to feelings a little easier than we can. I, and I'm not, that's not an insult. That's a good thing. God wants us to feel. Good. I'm glad you can feel. Most of the time, I've noticed in this culture, it's the women advocating for people more than the men. What a shame to us men. That we can't feel for the orphan. We can't feel for the unborn. We can't feel for the poor. We can't feel anything. This Samaritan was a man, and he felt. You can have feelings and compassion. It's not just for women. It's not weakness. Jesus wept more than once. Jesus wept when he saw Jerusalem. Jesus wept when his friend died. And he wept in the garden for all of us when he was going to the cross. He felt compassion, verse 34, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. 
and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The Levite was right. What good was it? The priest was right. What good was it? This expert in the law that Jesus is talking to you is, is right. What good is it? What good is your right doctrine if you do nothing? God would prefer a Samaritan because he can correct their doctrine later. He's looking for lovers. Can the Samaritan get better doctrine later? Yeah, and he needs it. <laughs> no doubt about it. Jesus is the teacher. Don't you get, don't, don't get me wrong. Jesus taught the woman at the well. I mean, he's, he's going to teach the Samaritan right doctrine. But you know what he's looking for? You know, the woman at the well had the same thing. What was the first thing when Jesus was kind to her at the well? What's the first thing she goes and does? She's like, come and listen to this guy. Come and know Jesus. She's not like, oh, I'm holier than the rest of the Samaritans now. She's like, I want you to know Jesus. And it says her whole city got saved. Yes. She has compassion. The story of the Good Samaritan, he has compassion. Where's the compassion? Yeah. Bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. I, I know, I know the religious mind would love to just spiritualize that. Oh yeah, well the, the bandage represented the word of God and the oil was the spirit of God and the wine was like the new wine of the new covenant. And No, this was just let it be what it was, friend. He took his broken body and he bandaged it and he put his body in an inn. And it was all physical. Stop spiritualizing what's physical. Some things are spiritualized. Some things are physical. God made physical bodies and he cares about physical bodies and not everything is about the spirit man. There are things about the physical man that God cares about. Yep. Verse 35. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. This is, this is wild to me. He brings him to the innkeeper. He pays for him to stay there. And he says, look, I'm going to need to draw up a line of credit. I'm going to need you to, that's what credit is. I'm going to need you to trust that I can pay it because I don't have it on me. So take these coins. I'm, I'm about my business. I wasn't expecting to do this. Pay attention. God is not convenient. Your neighbors will not be convenient. Good works are not convenient. If convenience rules whether you do something, you won't do anything. Satan will make sure that you always don't have a convenient moment. If he knows that that's what it will take, for you to do nothing, he'll just make sure. Oh boy. He'll not attack things so that they'll prosper, so that you're busy not doing what's good. Why do you think so many on earth are extremely rich and do nothing for anybody? Because Satan will purposefully not attack and that itself is an attack. Mm. If you being busy with success will keep you from helping people, watch out. Helping people is not convenient. Was it convenient for any of these three? No. The Samaritan just accepted what was. His neighbor was in need. It doesn't matter if it's convenient or not. I mean, you're going to drive by people who are literally on the side of the road without shoes, and the Holy Spirit is going to say, take them to get shoes. And you're either going to say yes or no. And you're not going to be able to, on Judgment Day, say, I was righteous by faith. Because Abraham would have put shoes on him when the Holy Spirit told him to. Because he believed. Now, let's say you failed, right? You've been the priest of the Levite. Praise God, you are still alive. You can repent. Why do you think Jesus is sharing the story of the Good Samaritan with an expert in the law who's not doing it? Isn't this his wake-up call? Yes. It might be yours. 
right answers won't get you in, folks. If you really believe, you'll love your neighbors. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples because of your love. The Samaritan is known as being a disciple, not because he's got all the right doctrine, though it's important to uh, get correct doctrine, but because he felt compassion when he saw people that were hurting, and that compassion moved in him to action, and he helped. And that's it. Helping people. That's it. That's it, folks. I know you might have wanted some deeper truth. You want me to explain the Greek and the Hebrew. You want me to go in deep on the end times. You want me to give you deeper and deeper doctrines on various topics in the Bible. Here's what you need to do, friend. Be a good Samaritan. What was Jesus' response to the expert in the law who wanted to talk shop and know the depths of correct doctrine with Jesus? He just went right back to the surface level and he said, you know what? You know what's important, buddy? I don't really care how much you know. You know what's important? That you do it. Do this and you'll live. Abraham did what he was told because he was righteous by faith. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. You don't get an out. You don't get an out. Right answers doesn't give you an out from loving your neighbor. I think that's why people are doing it. I really do. I think that some people are really studying the Bible so deeply so that they can cite it and debate it so that they can stand before Jesus and say, I contended for what was written. And he says, you didn't do anything for people in need. What did it matter? I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. I was a stranger. I was that orphan and you wouldn't invite me in. And they will say to him, Lord, when do we see you? When did we see you hungry? thirsty or naked, sick or in prison. Why did we see you a stranger and we didn't let you in? Whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Matthew 25, 46. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I don't care. Jesus doesn't care. If you're only giving right answers, we don't care. The Lord and his disciples don't care. Good, you answered correct. Good, go and do it. Remember where that story started. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember that the story of the Good Samaritan is a story of eternal life. Have I taught you righteousness by faith? Yeah, I have. I've pointed you to Abraham, the father of faith. I've pointed you to Jesus and relying on him for the forgiveness of your sins. And I've pointed you to the command to love, which no one will enter heaven without keeping that command. Because that command will prove whether you believed or didn't believe. That command is the one that Jesus uses in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, when he judges all of man, all, Adam to whoever the last person is, 
all stand before him in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. All of them. And you know, there'll be goats who could answer all the questions right. Some of you are learning the Bible not to learn what you must do. You're learning it as a defense against God. You're trying to learn it to make a case when you stand before God. You are. You're trying to learn the Bible so that you can make a legal case for your righteousness apart from obeying Jesus. You've tried to become an expert so that you can pass by. You're trying to find ways out. Notice the heart of the expert of the law. Even after he was told, he asked again, and who's my neighbor? See, he's trying to find a way. He's trying to find a way. And I'll tell you, Jesus will submit you either now or on judgment day. He will submit you. You will submit to this reality that loving your neighbor is a requirement of the children of Abraham. If you are circumcised of heart, you will love your neighbor. Turn to 1 John 3. We'll close with this. Uh, we'll read. Let's start from verse 14. See, we're talking about that sign and that seal. The greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. You might do mighty works because of faith. What, what? Balaam did mighty works, but he caused his fellow children of God to commit sexual immorality. He didn't love his neighbor. 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because, because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death or remains in death. You're still in death if you're not loving people. You might answer everything right. I might ask you, hey, quote to me 1 John 3, 14, and you don't even have to open a Bible. You just got it. Here's what it is. You might be an expert. But if you don't love, you abide in death. The saying is true. And it's actually true from God to you. I don't care how much you know. I want to know how much you care. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You know, it doesn't matter if you're pro-life, if you hate people that are born. You're a murderer too. You're judging all those ladies who have been deceived by the devil. You're a murderer too if you hate the living. If you hate those who are born, it doesn't matter that you say you're pro-life. What's that matter? The Bible says you're a murderer. There's no eternal life in you if you hate the living. It's easy to, to love the unborn. They haven't done anything wrong. Wait till they're born and they do something evil to you. Are you still going to love them? You know those are sinners in the womb, right? You realize that, right? They're not going to come out and be these wonderful, precious little babies forever. They're going to sin. And they might sin against you. Do you still love them then? Hmm? Verse 16. We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Jesus laid down his life. How do we know that Jesus loves us? Because... Us wicked, adulterous sinners, he forgives us, and then he dies for us. Yes. And then he tells us to leave the life of sin. He's kind to us before he tells us to leave our sins. Verse 17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? If you have this world's good and you don't help, 
You're the priest. You're the Levite. You're not the good Samaritan. It doesn't matter that you get it right. Experts in the law get the questions right. That's not the point of the story, was it? The point of the story was the Samaritan had this world's goods and he saw a body that was hurting and he helped the body because that body is made in the image of God. And then if you're a Christian, you'd also preach to them the word of God. Yes, so that they can be saved and enter life. Jesus did both. You do both. Not just one, both. Both. It's not good if you only feed people and you don't share them the truth and then they go to hell. And it's not good if you only share the truth and you don't feed them and they die of their poverty and difficulties. People are overwhelmed. Stress kills people. The church can come in and relieve a lot of stress. Stress kills people. Are you pro-life? Love the living too. Not just the pre-born. Take care of them. But whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? The point is, no, the love of God does not abide in you. So this, is not, this does not bode well for the expert in the law. When Jesus says, they'll know you're my disciple because of your love, and love is to take this world's goods and give it to people that are in need, and you don't do that, it doesn't bode well for you, regardless of whether you're answering rightly or not. You can answer rightly all day. And Jesus... Yeah, the expert in the law was right. He said, you've answered correctly. Do this. And you will live. Verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. God won't believe. He won't believe you until he sees you doing it. And he knows. I know we're dealing with God, okay? Sure, he knows in the heart whether you've truly been circumcised to the heart before you do anything, just like he did with Abraham. But believe you me, God foreknew Abraham would obey him. Hmm. If you're loving people in word, you're just giving them Bible passages, which again, preaching, I am not negating preaching. I'm just saying that right answers does not result in righteousness. Right living. Right living is the result of someone who has received salvation and righteousness by faith. Right living. See, the woman caught in adultery is forgiven and then she leaves her life of sin. Right living is the follow-up. And right living is taking what you have and helping people who are in need with it. And I preached this at Pentecost and it bears repeating now. If you want to see cancer babies healed, then give to those who are treating cancer children. And pray that God gives us the supernatural ability to lay hands on them and they, be, they recover that way. But you better start with what you've got and pray that God gives you more. And hopefully that more is not just money, but it becomes power. You know, the Bible talks about a gift of healing. I know there's promises of, of, of healing just by hearing the word and that's why we do that. But there's also something called a gift of healing. And a gift of healing is even different from that. A gift of healing is based off of the person who has the gift. You understand what I'm saying? The word of God can and does heal anyone who hears it and believes it. So thank God everybody can be healed. But then there's a gift of healing in scripture. Well, if you want to walk in the gift of healing, are you using the gift of money to heal people? I truly, wholeheartedly believe that's what God means when he spoke through Jesus And Jesus says that if you cannot be trusted with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? That he's absolutely talking about the gifts of the Spirit and money. And he's saying, if I can't trust you with money, how can I trust you with greater power? And so if you really love those kids who are hurting, then start giving to St. Jude and other charities that are serving. Hope for Henry, a number of different ones that are serving children with cancer. If you really care if you're really moved with compassion, what did the Samaritan do? He bandaged up his wounds. Go bandage up the wounds of cancer patients and believe God for the gift of healing. That's all I'm teaching. I'm not negating either. I'm actually saying, do what you can and ask God for the increase of supernatural power. But for right now, do what you can. Start there. Barnabas started with what he had and then God brought forth the increase of supernatural power. First, Barnabas became a generous, rich guy. That's the first thing that happened. He gave away everything. He was just this generous, 
formerly rich guy. And then God gave him increase and he started to open blind eyes. So start where Barnabas started. Start where Peter started, left his nets, gave it all away, served Jesus, right? Start where these guys started. Give love by giving, right? Faith, hope, and love remain, and the greatest of these is love. If you really believe, if you really put your hope in Jesus and in the promises, then start loving, and love is giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Did you receive something this morning? Are you going to confirm your calling and election like Peter says and make sure that you have this sign in your life that you love your neighbors? Will you check yourself? Jesus wanted the, the, the expert in the law to check himself and to repent and not just get the answers right, but to do it. Let's do it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. Pray that you've received a wonderful, powerful word of God today and that it changes your life forever. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends so that their lives can be changed forever, so that they can become good Samaritans and disciples of Jesus Christ as well. We're so grateful for you. If you'd like to give and support this ministry, there's a heart icon on YouTube. You can tap it and give, or you can give whether you're in person or online by texting the word give to 386-753-7337. We appreciate you. We pray the Lord blesses you, that he gives you health and prosperity, and that you would use that health and prosperity to help other people, and that it wouldn't just be for you, but it would be for the good of others. Hallelujah. And I pray that over everybody online and in person. The Lord loves you. In Jesus' name, have a wonderful week.